Well, my thanks uh, once again for turning out uh, on what is a very special day for the whole Christian church as it recalls uh, the cross of Calvary. Uh, I've uh, arranged to talk on a different topic uh, on discipleship and good works. And uh, I chose this topic deliberately because uh, it's one that uh, raises uh, great problems uh, for Protestants. And uh, I want to begin by just uh, saying a word or two about, uh, about uh, those difficulties. I say, first of all, that I've never spoken on this uh, topic myself before, and that probably is a symptom uh, of uh, just uh, how uh, thorny and challenging it is. Uh, I've been preaching now since uh, 1961, and uh, I've covered uh, most subjects uh, in uh, one way or other in the pulpit uh, over those uh, many years, but I've never uh, had the courage to deal with this subject until tonight, and uh, I put it down on the agenda uh, to force myself to address it uh, in this, uh, uh, I hope, uh, friendly uh, environment. Uh, another factor that uh, led to my decision was this. In a seminar at college uh, one day some years ago, we were discussing uh, Thomas Hogg of Kiltern in Rothschild, uh, one of the covenanting uh, sufferers uh, of the 17th century. And uh, Hogg was in many ways the founder of what we nowadays call higher evangelicalism. And he was a man who was uh, renowned for, for his piety as well as for his uh, ability as a preacher and theologian. But we were discussing in class uh, under Hogg's uh, guidance uh, what the marks of uh, true piety were. And we uh, deduced from Hogg, from, from Hogg uh, the usual uh, marks of grace. He was much given to uh, taking his own spiritual pulse, and he spoke much of his own, his own prayer life and uh, his own frames and his own communion and uh, much uh, in the same vein. But uh, one student said uh, rather awkwardly, there's no mention here of good works. This didn't seem to figure anywhere uh, in the list of attributes that uh, defined uh, someone as pious. And uh, I became defensive then as one does when students catch you out and moved on to the next question. Uh, but uh, that challenge uh, lived with me because we are very much inclined to uh, define spirituality in almost uh, esoteric terms. Uh, how long uh, one spends praying how much one longs for the Lord's Supper, uh, how keen one is to attend preaching services. And we have managed, indeed, to a large extent, to, to sideline this whole issue uh, of works as indicators uh, of our own spiritual condition. Uh, a, thir a third point that I might raise here is, again, uh, anecdotal. Uh, many years ago I was discussing, I was talking to an older minister and uh, uh, this minister had had uh, a very godly father and a very godly grandfather. And he made a remark which uh, at the time uh, I found uh, interesting and which has been ever since. My father, he says, could never compare with my grandfather in prayer, not remotely. But my grandfather could not compare with my father in life, in the way that he lived. Now, uh, he had a high regard for both his father and his grandfather. But that struck me uh, at the time as a, a very interesting comparison and contrast. And it highlights again the, the danger that... Uh, we are very much inclined to judge spirituality uh, by such things as the quality of prayer, the length of prayer, 
the time spent in seeking prayer and to neglect this other practical side uh, of the way that somebody lives. And uh, those three uh, points which I raised, the fact that I've never done it before myself, uh, the reference to Hog of Kiltern, and this uh, third uh, comparison between uh, father and grandfather, uh, I shared with you to explain why uh, I forced myself uh, to face this issue uh, with this uh, audience tonight. Now, uh, I, I realise that the reasons for uh, or neglect uh, are clear enough. Uh, we are uh, very concerned that we should not compromise the idea uh, of justification by, by, by grace uh, and end up with uh, justification by works. We are not justified uh, by uh, good works. Or as I prefer to express it uh, in terms of grace itself, the person who has no good works to his credit or to her credit may still know justification and acceptance uh, with God. Uh, I probably told you already the story uh, of uh, David Dixon, how he said uh, on his deathbed that he made a bundle uh, of his good works uh, and then of his bad works and he fled uh, from them both to Christ. We can't be justified, uh, obviously, by, by our evil actions, nor again by our, our good actions. But the gospel is that those who are bankrupt in the area of works may nevertheless experience uh, peace with God. Now, on this particular topic uh, of uh, negating the Roman doctrine of justification by works, uh, there are perhaps uh, three things to be said. Uh, the first is that certainly we are not justified by works, but by the sheer grace and clemency of God. There is nothing of which we would boast, uh, not our own morality, uh, not our own prayer life, uh, not our own piety, our own frames, uh, our own amskim liberality, there is nothing of which I hope we would dare boast uh, before God. I remember saying this uh, once to an older Christian, and he was most scornful of me. And he was scornful because, not because he, he disagreed with my fundamental point that we had nothing to boast of, but he had such a dim view of human nature, at least of my human nature, that he, he was convinced that I would boast of my works. And I thought a good deal about that. Uh, I know at a theological level that I have no works to boast of. But do I nevertheless make my works the ground of my boasting? And I do suspect that somehow uh, that idea can come in by the back door. Uh, it can come in in terms of, of this, that a great deal of our lack of assurance uh, is due to a lack of satisfaction with our own works. And does that indicate that in the last analysis, despite all protestations, we still believe it is down to our own works? For example, if we lose our peace with God, because our conviction of sin or our prayer life or our faith are not good enough or strong enough. Is that a symptom of the fact that despite what we profess to believe, we do in fact believe that we are justified by works? And when we find our works deficient or defective, our peace goes. In other words, do we feel more at peace with God when we've had a good day, than when we've had a bad day, and I mean a good day spiritually. If you've enjoyed your Bible study more, or your prayer has got better, do you then feel more forgiven, and more justified, and closer to God? Uh, I'm just asking because uh, there is the possibility we're still uh, in bondage to the idea that it does depend 
on ourselves, on what we do, on what we feel, on what we experienced. But uh, the base of negative is still, is still important. We are not justified uh, by works. The second thing I wanted to bring in here is that there is no possibility uh, of what in Catholicism is referred to uh, as works of supererogation. That is, works which uh, can put us uh, in credit as distinct from debit with God. Uh, when we can have not simply uh, a balancing of the books, but we can have more than a balance, we can have a positive credit. Now, Catholicism is a very complex uh, arrangement here, suggesting that uh, it is possible uh, for us to do things that really go beyond what God expects, and we thereby build up uh, a treasury of merit. And uh, in particular, uh, those who are saints, uh, they build up this treasury, and uh, that's why uh, other poor sinners can benefit uh, from that treasury, because if a saint has done more than he needs, then the balance can, acc can accrue to us uh, if we perform uh, various satisfactions. Now, the theory is very crude, and I suspect that many modern Catholics uh, no longer believe it or practice it. But certainly, uh, all of us surely know that we are always in God's debt, and that there is no possibility of our doing more than God expects and building up uh, some treasury for ourselves. We are all at the last unprofitable servants. I would even be arguing here that Christ himself did not, as mediator, uh, engage in works of supererogation. Now, it was a work of supererogation for him to become mediator and to put himself under the law. He was not under obligation to do either of these things. But once he did put himself under the law and once he became mediator, he in fact did nothing but what the law required and did not in any sense go beyond what that law required. To do thy will, I take delight, is simply finish the work which was given him to do in his capacity as his people's saviour. So what happens in Christ's case is not uh, that uh, the credit balance, uh, that is, what he achieved by going beyond the law's demands, that that balance accrues to us. What is imputed to us is not the balance left over after Jesus' own needs, but the whole of what Jesus did uh, accrues to us. The third part I want to make here is that uh, our Christian works are never perfect. They are always tainted with sin and uh, with inadequacy. We can't bring our very best actions to the touchstone of, uh, of, God's, of God's law or of God's standard. Uh, all that we do is uh, by sin. There is something wrong in the motive or there is something wrong in the performance. Uh, always our own human sin comes in to mar uh, all that we do. Nevertheless, those good works we perform are acceptable to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And I think this is a very important and precious point, that although they are inadequate, still God our Father is pleased with them. Uh, and that Father dimension is important. You know how sometimes uh, we as parents uh, pass so fond a judgment on what our own children do. Uh, 
and uh, the first painting or drawing, uh, maybe, you know, not quite Picasso. In fact, my last painting wasn't Picasso either, but uh, even uh, the children, the children starting off, uh, their efforts uh, are so inadequate. Nevertheless, the parent is so thrilled. And uh, when the child performs small tasks, uh, washes her first dish, makes her first cup of tea or whatever, uh, then the parents are so pleased, all oh, that is so acceptable. Now, I, I'm very much of the view that God thinks his children are wonderful. Uh, and I think that uh, in that context, as we serve him in our own childish, grace-aided way, and as we present uh, what we achieve to God uh, through our Lord Jesus Christ, God is thrilled with our performances. And I, w- I think we should take that on board because uh, sometimes, uh, oddly enough, I think we are far harder on ourselves than God is on us. Uh, And I think we have to learn to remind ourselves uh, that God is thrilled uh, by some uh, of what we do because he loves us so much, uh, he judges in love, and he sees what we offer uh, not in isolation as my individual offering, but uh, the offering of the body of Christ, of which his own beloved son uh, is the head. So here we have those uh, three or four points that we are not uh, justified by works. Uh, Second, there are no works for supererogation. Thirdly, our works are not perfect. And yet fourthly, our works uh, are acceptable. Now, all of these negatives, in a way, as they are, uh, are, are important. Nevertheless, there is a very, very clear insistence in the New Testament on the importance of works uh, in the context uh, of our own discipleship. And we find that emphasis in every strand uh, of the New Testament. For example, we find it uh, in Jesus' own teaching. Uh, In Matthew 5, uh, for example, in the Sermon on the Mount, where he speaks of it will be the light of the world and the salt of the earth. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. In other words, where does the light shine? Does it, does it shine simply in the position of our theology, in the splendor of our prayers, public and private, or of our other gifts? No, he says it shines in in our works, in our beautiful works, those beautiful things that that we do for God. That is where the light shines. Uh, To confirm what I said earlier on about the difficulty we have with this whole area, uh, I went back to get some light uh, on this passage uh, from... uh, to Dr. Lloyd-Jones and a superb exposition uh, on the Sermon on the Mount. And I found that though he does preach on that verse, he does not mention good works. He preaches on, let your light shine. And he has some superb things to say on how our light must shine and what we must do to ensure that it does shine. But he does not, maybe for lack of time, he does not take up this other question uh, of of those beautiful things that we do for God. But that's what Jesus said. He he will say later on that our righteousness must exceed that of scribes and Pharisees. You say, well, now hold on a minute. Uh, These Pharisees were legalists and they were always, uh, they thought they were saved by works. And Jesus abolished that in that whole scenario and Uh, He spoke about being meek and not about works. But what Jesus said was uh, that the ethic of the Pharisees was not rigorous enough. And your standards and your achievements must exceed and excel those of the Pharisees. Now, as I said, I'm sure here uh, often enough, 
Phariseeism uh, was uh, an ethic of evasion. It was a way of finding your way around the law. Now, we in the free church know that kind of ethic uh, very, very well, for example, because we have a, a, a rubric that we mustn't use hymns in public worship. But we are very good at finding uh, times when, when we, we may use hymns in public worship. Uh, uh, that's what the Pharisees did all the time. They were saying, when does the law not apply? When are we free from this act of assembly? When are we free from this part uh, of the word of God? When may we do what the law forbids? And Jesus said, on the contrary, your righteousness must exceed that uh, of the scribes and the Pharisees. And he said too, of course, that by, your, by their fruits you shall know them. You know the tree by its fruits. You don't know it by its top. Robert Burns, as you recall, spoke uh, scathingly uh, of uh, what was simply uh, a religion of the mouth. And uh, Jesus too has that same concern. Uh, he wants us to have a religion which is known uh, and uh, verified and attested uh, by the fruit uh, that it bears. We have this also, of course, uh, in St. Paul, uh, the same emphasis on, on good works. For example, in Ephesians uh, uh, 2, uh, verse 10, Paul speaks uh, of uh, our being created in, in Christ Jesus unto good works which God ordained that uh, we should uh, walk in them. God prepared them beforehand uh, for us to walk in. That whole verse, Ephesians 2, 10, is very interesting because uh, for one thing it reminds us that we have not been saved because of our good works. We are in Christ not because of our good works, but unto or with a view to good works. Being in Christ, being born again, being saved by God, comes before the good works. But being in Christ is with a view to good works in order to our performing uh, those uh, good works. And he makes a remarkable statement uh, that God has prepared those works beforehand. This very unusual view of predestination. What has God foreordained for us? And you say, well, we don't know what blessings God has foreordained for us. We don't know what sorrows God has foreordained for us. But here, Paul is looking at the good works that Paul, that God has foreordained for us. And the Christian life he envisages there as almost this, this romance where we, every day, we meet up with the good works that God has prepared for us from eternity. Maybe tomorrow God has prepared that we should meet up with some good work. That's how he sees it. And uh, uh, that's simply to underline that for Paul, uh, as for Jesus, uh, works were uh, enormously important. And you find this too, of course, uh, in James uh, with his uh, great teaching. Uh, on, uh, on faith and works and it's a very bold statement that Abraham was not justified by, by faith but he was justified by works. Now uh, what's of course been brought out here is that uh, the faith that justifies is a saving, is a working faith. It is not inert or sterile or unproductive or purely intellectual it is a living faith and it expresses that livingness in the works that it performs. In fact, uh, the Apostle Paul himself uh, spoke in terms when he, he told the church of Thessalonica uh, that uh, we were to practice uh, the work of faith and the patience of hope and the labor of love. The work of faith that's Paul speaking.
And uh, the word for work there is a specific uh, term uh, that really means uh, like the work of an artist. This particular work of Picasso, this work of Mozart, this work of Shakespeare, uh, it is the product, not the effort. And he's saying, well, faith, Paul says, has its products, just as James says that faith itself works. And if it doesn't work, it's dead. If it has no products, it's dead. Just as love is useless, if love doesn't labor, love toils on behalf of the loved one. So love toils, faith produces. And it is that productive faith, uh, James says, uh, that justifies uh, not uh, a dead faith. So we have it in, uh, in Jesus, we have it in Paul, uh, we have it in James, we have it also, of course, in John, uh, the apostle of love. It reminds us that love uh, is not simply a God word uh, uh, affection, but also a man word. If, 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 if love sees a brother in need, then that love is going to uh, relieve uh, that particular need. So here uh, in the Bible is, I think, a very clear emphasis on the importance, indeed the inevitability of good works. If you're a Christian, you shy. If you're a good tree, you bear fruit. If you have faith, that faith produces. Uh, if you're a believer, uh, you are bound to express your love uh, in, in practical ways. Now, going on uh, beyond uh, the New Testament's teaching, there is a remarkably long chapter on uh, good works in uh, our Confession of Faith, uh, chapter 16. It is, in fact, uh, a very lengthy chapter. And that's a reminder to us that <clears throat> whatever embarrassment we may feel about relating works to justification, the reformers and their successors uh, were not at all dismayed by that embarrassment. And in the very same context as they insist uh, on justification by grace alone through faith, they will insist on the necessity uh, of good works. Now that chapter uh, I commend to you most warmly, chapter 16 of the Confession of Faith, I'll take out of it basically uh, one fundamental principle, and that is this. They insisted that good works are only such as God has commanded. What is a good work? A good work is something that God has commanded. And in saying that, they are also protesting against the idea that men can invent works that go beyond what God commands and we can then offer them to him as not only good works but as supremely outstandingly meritorious works although God didn't command them. Now what they have in mind of course uh, would be such things as the Pharisaic practice uh, of tithing uh, mint or, or anise or cumin or tithing parsley. And God could say, I didn't ask for a tithe on parsley. No, but we thought you might like it all the same. Now, uh, they say, a good work is commanded by God. And if it's not sanctioned by God, then it can't be a good work. Uh, or again, the medieval practice uh, of uh, going on pilgrimages. Again, uh, God, God might say, I didn't ask for this. Who has asked you to go on pilgrimages? But we say, well, we thought it was a very good idea. But just because you didn't ask for it, that we might go beyond what you wanted uh, and give you something extra. Now, uh, the Protestant uh, theologians were saying, that it is an essential quality of a good work that it is commanded by God. 
And it's essential because the core idea is you are doing it to please God. How do you know it pleases God? Because your imagination tells you? Or your own instincts tell you? No, you know because God commanded it. And only then can you have certainty. You are doing it to please Him. And you know it pleases Him because He asks you to do it. Now that means that to uh, identify uh, what it means uh, to practice good works, we have to go back down into the Word of God itself and ask uh, what good works does that Word of God command or commend to us. Again, if I can look at uh, just a few key passages, the one that comes most instantly to mind is, of course, Matthew 25, the great picture of the great assize, as John Wesley called it, the parable of the sheep and the goats. And you remember the criteria that Jesus uh, applies in his judgment on that great occasion. You remember that he doesn't ask uh, any Bible knowledge questions, ask any theological questions, doesn't ask questions about our prayer lives or even about our witnessing. But he simply, out of his own omniscience as the Son of God and the Son of Man, he simply assesses uh, what we have done in various relationships. And uh, the sheep receive the accolade because when he was sick and in prison, they visited him. When he was hungry, they fed him. When he, were, when he was thirsty, they gave him drink. And when he was naked, they clothed him. And he, they said, but Lord, when did we do that to you? And he said, you didn't do it to me, but you did it to one of these little ones. And in doing it to them, you did it to me. Now, there is a very interesting question raised by that passage. That is, what Jesus means by doing it to one of the least of these little ones. Who are they? Is that saying primarily or perhaps even exclusively that uh, being good to disciples... Uh, is going to uh, secure for us entry into heaven. Or are the little ones all Jesus' brothers and sisters of the entire human race to whom he is united and related by community of nature? Christ himself, as has been said, uh, is a sacrament of the poor. He is representative of the world's poor. And doing it to the world's poor is doing it to him. Not doing it to the poor is not doing it to him. Now I don't know by what process we evade the force of this great parable. Because it's saying to us that our entry to heaven does not depend on our being Protestants or Evangelicals or Free Church or on our theological knowledge or our stock of biblical ideas or any of the uh, typical uh, phenomena of religion. The number of meetings we go to, the length of time we spend in private prayer, now, all of these things are part of the total picture of a complete Christian life. But we have managed to leave out of the picture an element which Jesus says is one of the most important of all the elements in the picture. Uh, that is, this whole question of what we have done for the sick, for the hungry, for the naked, 
and for the imprison for the victims of oppression. Jesus himself went about doing good. And he went about doing good precisely for this class of people, many of whom were, of course, among the socially marginalized, because in our society, if you are uh, imprisoned, if you're naked, if you're hungry, if you're homeless, then you are on the margins. And uh, it goes along with that, that those who associate with you and help you uh, are themselves risking uh, social uh, obloquy uh, and, and exclusion. And of course it was said of Jesus that he was a friend uh, of publicans and sinners. Uh, he received sinners and he even eats with the sinners. But the good works mean that we do what is in our power to relieve the needs of our fellow uh, human beings. And we have to face the fact that on the day of judgment, it is by that criterion Jesus will judge us. And indeed, if we had no other uh, chapter of the Bible but Matthew 25, we would think that nothing else would matter. Within that frame, all that matters is whether we have been kind to the hungry, the thirsty, the naked, the imprisoned, and the destitute. That is the mark of a Christian. The mark. That is the criterion of our fitness for heaven. And God will say, well done, good and faithful servant. He will not say, well done, good and faithful theologian, good and faithful preacher, but well done, because I was in prison, I was sick, I was hungry, I was naked, and so on, and you met my need. That was Jesus' own lifestyle. Now we talk of emulating him. And the emulation must include uh, to a very large degree, this fact that we emulate him in uh, going about doing good. Take again uh, Paul's insistence in Galatians that uh, we must remember the poor. Remember how he met uh, what he calls the pillar apostles in Jerusalem, Peter, James, and John, and how they discussed, they wanted to know what gospel Paul had because he hadn't got his gospel from them. And they wanted to check out what kind of gospel he had. So he told them, I got my gospel, my revelation directly from God. And this is my gospel. And he told them, uh, they said, well, that is the same gospel as we have. We're very happy to endorse that gospel or to uh, have fellowship with you in preaching that gospel. Only he said, they would, they wished that I should remember the poor. Which thing also... I was uh, uh, very anxious to do. So uh, it is not uh, originally a Pauline preoccupation. Uh, it's a point put to Paul uh, by the Jewish uh, uh, apostles and one that he is instinctively more than happy to endorse, to remember the poor. Now, as we heard in the opening prayer, of course, uh, this has to mean uh, more than sentiment and more than words. And uh, you have to link to that fact in St. Paul that uh, he didn't uh, simply take aboard the principle, uh, but he also went on, as we know from Second Corinthians, to organize a collection for the poor in Jerusalem. And I can well imagine that in some uh, uh, reformed or truly reformed churches today, if you were to do that, you would be seen perhaps uh, as uh, a do-gooder and uh, perhaps also uh, something of a social gospeler. And it might even be so thought that maybe your theology wasn't all it should be, that you thought you might get to heaven by uh, having collections for the poor. And this is why I've taken up this whole topic, because I'm so pleased as to how we got ourselves into this point. Uh, so here we have 
And I think it's a magnificent thing because, uh, you know, sometimes uh, great men complain how much time they're going to spend on trivialities. And uh, their uh, lieutenants tell them, you should waste your time uh, on such things. Leave that to your minions and so on. Well, here is the Apostle Paul uh, with uh, this mighty theological brain with this tremendous apostolic authority and the cares of all the churches and uh, he is uh, organizing a collection for the poor. And not simply that, but he takes it to Jerusalem himself because he wants to be, to be sure that it is secure and that there is responsible accounting for it. So he will take it himself. So the whole diagonal burden now in Acts chapter 5, of course, the apostle said, it's not right for us to leave the word of God and to serve tables. They, they were saying, we're apostles, we're preachers, we're teachers, and uh, we shouldn't uh, be in the soup kitchen, which is more or less what they were talking about. But here is Paul, and he is performing exactly the work of a deacon, because he's remembering the poor, and he knows that those Jerusalem saints are in terrible straits. And he doesn't simply talk about it or intimate it, but he does something about it. Now that shames me before it shames uh, anybody else. But this was part of his Christianity. And of course, it wasn't simply himself, but uh, he is commending the Macedonians, and he's urging the Corinthians to be involved. The Macedonians, he said, they've been so generous, and there's some of the most magnificent language in the New Testament uh, in that uh, section of uh, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9. Remember how to their power and beyond their power they were generous. They gave all that they could, not as little as they could get off with, but they were remembering their poor brothers and sisters in Jerusalem. And they gave all they could, and then some more. And he says, too, that it was out of their deep poverty that their liberality abounded. They had nothing. And yet they gave liberally. They had nothing, and they gave liberally. So they were involved with the apostle. They, too, were uh, remembering uh, the poor. And, of course, they had, first of all, give themselves to the Lord, first themselves, and then out of their deep poverty, they gave so liberally. So here is the great apostle, the champion of uh, justification by faith alone. Somebody who, who knows that he is never going to earn salvation by the quality of his organization, or his self-denial, or his liberality, but who, having been just a And uh, uh, I think that uh, with all our suspicions of liberation theology, there is a profoundly Christian correctness and a Christian sense of proportion in this, in that whole emphasis, Bias to the poor. The whole Western world has been, is biased in favor of the rich. This land today is biased still in favor of the rich. Sometimes the churches are biased in favor of the rich. We have to get back to a bias in favor of the poor. Jesus' bias was not in favor of the rich and the powerful. His bias was in favor of the poor and the excluded. And what the apostle said to Paul, and what Paul went on to implement was great principle, only remember the poor. We find this also, of course, in James. Here James poses the question, what is true godliness? 
swan is through piety and he says it is to remember the fatherless and the widow in their affliction. And you say, well, yes, we remember them. We pray for them. He didn't mean that. He means remember in the way that God remembered his people in Egypt. And he went on to take them out of bondage. It is a practical remembering. Again, the bias is in favor of the non-privileged, of those who are having uh, a tough time. And it's not simply remember them with sympathy, with oodles of compassion, but remember them uh, in a practical way, so that you bear the burdens of those who cannot uh, bear uh, the burdens uh, themselves. James also, of course, speaks to your eyes early, uh, of somebody who sees his brother, another human being, someone made in the image of God, without daily food, without clothing. And you go to him and you say, God bless you, brother. But you don't feed him and you don't clothe him. Do you remember see yourselves, perhaps, uh, in that too? Well, I know perfectly well uh, all the complications involved in responding to the beggars in our own streets. But I don't think your conscience should ever be easy in walking past any of these men or women. And we certainly ought not to pass by simply saying, God bless you. Because that is really uh, adding not only insult but blasphemy uh, to uh, our own lack uh, of human kindness. You must take a practical action, uh, James says, uh, to deal with that kind of problem. But go back beyond that into the Old Testament and some of the very intriguing instances of good works we find in the Old Testament. If we take the case of Abraham, especially in the light of James's commentary on Abraham's faith and Abraham's justification, when Abraham offered a Isaac, how was he justified? Was it by faith or by works? Uh, was it uh, simply by believing uh, that God exists? Or was it by sacrificing his own son? And James says, it was in that sacrificing of a son that Abraham was justified. No, not by it, but the faith we know from Hebrews that when uh, Abraham sacrificed Isaac, as he did, says the writer in a figure, uh, he didn't actually uh, uh, use a knife to sacrifice him. But the intention had been formed in his heart when God arrested him. He fully intended to sacrifice Isaac. But he did it, Hebrews tells us, because he believed that God would raise him from the dead. And he believed that because God had said to him, In Isaac shall thy seed be called. And somehow Abraham thought, Although I will cut his throat and see him bleed to death, nevertheless, in Isaac shall my seed be called. And Abraham's faith worked in that supreme sacrifice. Now, I've never been sure that there is any uh, modern equivalent to that. How can I extrapolate from Mount Moriah uh, to modern Scotland? But there are limited analogous ways in which God asks us to sacrifice things very close and precious to ourselves. And that may, they may be related sometimes uh, to uh, our attitudes towards uh, our own children. Uh, because we sometimes form uh, our own plans and our own uh, 
uh, ambitions for them and then God has uh, other uses for them. And it can be very hard sometimes for parents to allow God the use of their children. But it was in that practical action in this, in this willingness to sacrifice what is most precious to us. And you know, that is a shuddering thought. What may God ask us to renounce? What pain may God ask us to face? Is our faith up to, to that, to surrendering to God? I don't mean necessarily in death. Surrendering some cherished ambition, some precious possession, even willingly to let God withdraw a talent that God at one time gave us. This requirement to be totally submissive, to say, not my will, but your will uh, be done. Uh, that is a challenge that we have uh, as the story of Abraham and Isaac takes us to the very uh, precipice uh, of uh, the God-man relationship. But there are some other fascinating uh, works as well in the Old Testament. Remember, for example, the story of Rahab and how, how Rahab uh, protected the spies. Now, the Bible does not uh, uh, pass any moral judgment on Rahab in the light of her own uh, profession as a prostitute. But what's more interesting is that Rahab uh, protects and preserves the spies in a way that was, to say the least, duplicitous. She hides them on the roof and covers them with a thatch. And when the, when the messengers come from the authorities, she says, oh yes, they did come, but they've gone. And I don't know where they went. And there is not a word of condemnation passed by the text on that action. Uh, and it may, it's a reminder to us, and uh, this is something you need to, to chew on rather than take from me, uh, that we cannot always, if I can use the language of Bonhoeffer, afford the luxury of a good conscience. Rehab uh, could have said, it's never right to lie. And I had no option but to tell the messengers where the men were hiding. But she has to make a judgment that here one principle, one obligation takes precedence over another. The lives of these men and not only that but Rahab's faith the work of the kingdom of God. And uh, she made the judgment that in that context, the sanctity of life was more important than the sanctity of truth. And she made that adjustment. Now there are many, many areas in modern, in the complexities of modern life, where we face decisions that match Rahab's decision in magnitude, especially in the whole area uh, of medical ethics, where there are choices over prioritizing and choices over uh, techniques which may bring uh, great benefits, uh, but which yet involve infringement uh, of some of our own uh, dearest principles. And I'm not going to ask you uh, to uh, violate your own consciences uh, on any of these matters, but I'm going to ask you to be tolerant and indulgent with regard to Christians who in the political arena, who in the medical arena, in the scientific arena, have to wrestle with ethical questions uh, that are of the unimaginable complexity and to often have to sacrifice one set of principles as they balance it over against uh, another set. That's what 
Rahab had to do. Did Rahab do a good work? She told a lie. Was it a good work? And yet it was a good work. It was one that God commended and one that was pivotal in the development of God's kingdom. There is a very similar incident in in Exodus chapter 2, the story uh, of the Hebrew midwives. There was a decree from Pharaoh that uh, all the Hebrew boys uh, should be uh, killed at birth. And the midwives uh, were so instructed. But the midwives, we are told, feared God. And they didn't carry out that particular commandment. And then when they were challenged, they said, oh, but these Hebrew women aren't like Egyptian women. They have much shorter labors. And before we arrive on the scene, the baby is born. And we can't do a thing about it. Now, of course, uh, that was simply uh, uh, fiction. (laughs) It was remotely true. But the text again passes no adverse judgment. They feared God, and so they said what was not true. Because they had to preserve life. And to preserve the lives of those babies, uh, they took this course of action. Now, you may say, of course, in your armchair, uh, they should have uh, told the truth and faced the consequences and uh, even uh, faced uh, perhaps execution for what they did. But then there was no very great supply of Hebrew midwives. You would soon get to a point where there were no Hebrew midwives. That whole kind of casualty, the tragedy is the times are out of joint. We're living in a fallen world where principle is in collision with principle, and where scarcely any of us can go through life with a good conscience. The decisions we have to make sometimes so difficult. If you do that, then this will happen. If you don't do this, then that will happen. And you make a choice, and what you feared happens. What you feared and knew would happen, happens. And you've got to live with it. We've seen so many of those cases with regard, for example, uh, to uh, Siamese twins uh, and and such things recently. And uh, all I'm pleading for is is compassion for those who in cities must do the good thing. Or must do the right thing which is not good. The right thing that means that one of the babies dies. The death of that baby is not good. But it was the right thing to take the course of action that meant that at least one of the children survived. And I think all that is mandated uh, by such incidents as the story of Rahab or the story uh, of the Hebrew midwives. Well, uh, I, I'm going to bring this uh, to, to a close. I didn't realize that it was that late. Just uh, two couple of points to be uh, to be made here. One is the the seminal Reformation principle: we are justified by faith alone, but the faith that it justifies is never alone. That faith is always accompanied by love. And always accompanied by hope. So there can be no sterile, inert, inactive faith. But a faith that lives. And it lives in its works. And finally, those works have to be visible. Let your light shine. So that men will see your good works. They will see you doing beautiful things for God and they will glorify your Father which is in heaven.
And I wonder, uh, as we close, if we have taken that fully on board, we are committed by the Word of God to the individual practicing of good works. We are also committed by God's Word to structuring and organizing the church so that it is as an organization dedicated to the performance of good works. In other words, not only do believers go about doing good, but the church as institution goes about doing good. And men see those good works and the glorified Father who is in heaven. We are all painfully conscious of the low esteem in which a church is held in modern society. And we have various solutions to it. Oh, if revival came. Oh, if the church were reformed, if the church were purified. Have we given sufficient attention to this? That if the church were about doing good, men would see those good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. A tremendous amount of effort is being put into the church. The quality of preaching in the church is as high as it has been, I'm sure, at any time in the last hundred years. It's not the lack of services or the lack of effort or the lack of preaching abilities. We multiply services. We invent more, add more, never discontinue any, but we're always adding them. But what about this other thing, the good works? The practical institutional concern for the poor, for the hungry, for the naked, for the thirsty, for the imprisoned, for the excluded in our own society and in the world. When you say yourself, that is a good church. I really enjoy being in that church. Did this enter into the calculation? It was a church which was doing beautiful things for men and women in the name of God. And uh, I don't think I've really uh, come with a program, but I I hope that I may to an extent have succeeded uh, in the uh, uh, inducing some uh, measure of disturbedness. But I shall leave it there, and uh, any question might uh, have some discussion on the issues you want to raise.